Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Kenneth Rudd. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Hold your applause. Hold your applause. Kenneth Rudd was diagnosed with NF1 as a baby, and he and his family have been involved with the Children's Tumor Foundation for almost 40 years. He's been a member of CTF's Board of Directors for five years and currently chairs its Legal Affairs and Ethics Committee. Ken graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law and Amherst College. He's a lawyer and a partner in the firm of Zeichner, Eilman, and Krauss in New York City. He practices in the areas of anti-money laundering, government investigations, hmm, and commercial litigation. He routinely represents financial institutions in connection with congressional, regulatory, and grand jury investigations, and often partners with other law firms to advise on anti-money laundering issues. It's my pleasure to, prevent, to present Kenneth Rudd. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning again. Uh, my name is Ken Rudd, and I have NF1. Uh, thank you to NYU Langone and to Carol Mitchell for inviting me to come speak today. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I'd like to speak today about several things uh, surrounding my NF experience and my history with the Children's Tumor Foundation. I am not a scientist. I'm not a medical professional. As Carol said, I'm a lawyer, so sorry about that. Um, whenever I read about scientific and medical issues with NF and the amazing advances that are being made, I wished I had studied more science in school to help me better un understand those issues and the medicine. Especially now, especially when <clears throat> such remarkable advances are being made and when we seem to be on the cusp of FDA approval of the very first drug to treat plexiform tumors. I also wish I had more patience to take the time now to educate myself about the scientific issues. Um, I just don't, um, but given the turnout here, I assume I, I'm, I'm in the minority. Uh, for the past five years or so, I have had the privilege of sitting on the board of directors of the Children's Tumor Foundation. Its vision is to end NF, period. And that sounds pretty darn good to me. I was born 50 years ago to two remarkable parents. There was no foundation then. The gene hadn't been identified. 50 years ago, NF was little known, little known by doctors, little known by the public, uh, and what was known about it was often misunderstood. But in so many ways, I was lucky. I was diagnosed as a baby, Frankly, I don't know all the signs and manifestations that I showed then that I exhibited at birth, but I was missing most of my tibia in my left leg. My parents went into action to find out what was wrong with me and how they could help me and how they could treat the pseudoarthrosis. They didn't know what the future would hold and it must have been, as I'm sure the parents here recognize, quite terrifying. For those here who are too young, or who have kids or who are young, remember that 50 years ago, there were no personal computers, there was no internet, there wasn't yet a foundation to help those of us with NF. There was little information easily available to my folks. And of course, neither of them had NF. Also, back when I was born, NF was also known as the elephant man's disease an awful epithet named after Joseph Merrick, an Englishman born in the 1860s, who had significant deformities. It was only, I think, in the mid-1980s when the scientific community came to realize that Merrick didn't have NF, but had a far, far rarer disorder. But as a child, I thought that I had NF. Excuse me, I thought I had that disease, although admittedly with far less severe symptoms. And when kids asked, it's what I would say to them. I'd say, I have that, but a lot less severely. My paternal grandparents were both physicians, which undoubtedly gave my parents a leg up on 
helping with my medical issues. I've seen some of those early medical records, and they're quite interesting. And it's this very strange feeling to read about myself now in middle age as an infant. One month after I was born, a report says the appearances are compatible histologically with that of a pseudoarthrosis or, on the other hand, neurofibromatosis. My grandfather sent some slides to a friend of his at the National Cancer Institutes who responded that he and several of his colleagues had reviewed the slides but were unable to make a diagnosis of tumor. I assume that that was a biopsy of my leg. My, my parents were advised to have my leg amputated below the knee. They were told that this would give me the greatest possible function. I never resented or questioned that decision. It all seemed perfectly normal to me. After all, I could walk. I could run. I could do almost anything other kids could do, albeit less quickly and less well, perhaps. And I always understood that I couldn't have walked without a bone in my leg. But my grandmother, God bless her, was wonderful and insightful. She was a pediatrician and an adolescent medicine doc. And she had the truly brilliant idea of filming me so that I wouldn't resent, when I grew up, the decision to amputate my leg. I didn't learn of the existence of that footage until I was an adult. And so what is now, excuse me, what was then on Super 8 film is now on video and perhaps should move to something more permanent. But there are two wonderful scenes of me. Um, one is of me in, in, in our apartment at about the age of two or so. I'm standing on my good leg with my other leg held somewhat aloft. And I don't know, I'm dancing or shaking or doing something a toddler does. And my leg is just sort of waggling because it has no bone in it to keep it stiff. Um, but I have a big smile on my face. And another one is simply of me and my mother walking hand in hand, wearing a brace on my leg before my amputation so that I could actually walk. I also, I have this vague memory of being at my grandparents' house in upstate New York at about the age of six or so. And my brother and I were playing in the yard. And a couple of young girls walked by and asked what was wrong with me. And my big brother didn't miss a beat. He looked at them and said, he's bionic. <laughs> Do you want to watch him run around the house? He paused a beat and said, there. He did it. Now, I don't know if the girls bought it or not. I like to think that they did, but I, I frankly don't remember or, or if I could tell at the time. Um, now, I, I don't mean to imply that I have liked having only one leg. I, I don't, and I didn't. Uh, I hated it. I hated the stares of other children. I, I, I hated the questions. I hated being slower than other kids. Uh, I hated not being able to keep up physically. I hated feeling different. I hated looking different. But mostly then, I, I hated the stairs. I grew up here in New York, and when I was six years old, I was with my mother on the corner of 94th Street and Columbus Avenue. And I decided to have some fun and run and pretend to hide from my mother. I tripped on some stairs that are there, landed on my forearm, and I broke both bones in my forearm. My ulna has healed. My radius never healed. So once again, pseudoarthrosis decided to mess with me. I've lived almost my entire life with a weak right forearm in an orthotic. As a child, an F for me meant going to many more doctor's appointments than my peers did. Um, and that could make me angry and self-conscious. It meant, of course, lying in machines to scan to see if I had a brain tumor. I remember that, but frankly, I don't remember being scared of the risks about NF in that way. I knew they might develop, I just don't remember fear. As I grew from a child into adolescence, when fitting in became ever more important, the plexiform tumor on my face grew more pronounced. It occludes the vision in my right eye, uh, and it closes the canal on my right ear, making 
hearing a little bit worse. The plexiform neurofibroma has affected my life, my relationships with my peers, my social life, and my professional life, far more greatly than did my arm and my leg. It's hard enough being 15 or 50 without having significant facial disfigurement. I am lucky though, and I know that I've never had a brain tumor or a spinal tumor, and F has not impacted my internal organs, um, except perhaps for my appendix, but who needs one of those anyway? Um, as Carol said, I attended Amherst College and the University of Virginia School of Law, and I became a reasonably successful professional. Early on in my career, both after graduating from college and from law school, I know that my disfigurement hurt me in my job searches. On occasions, people's discomfort was palpable. I am convinced that oftentimes, employers just didn't want to hire somebody who looked like me. Once after law school, I was interviewing for a job at a mid-sized law firm. After shaking the partner's hand, and I always shake with my left hand, he looked at me and he said, and this is verbatim, what the hell happened to you? If I was the man I am today, I would have told him to F off and walked out of his office. I might have snorted at him, or I might have taken the opportunity to explain that he was being extraordinarily rude and inappropriate. But I didn't. At the time, I felt desperate for a job, and I sat there for 20 or 30 minutes in a reasonably pointless job interview. At about the age of 16, I had surgery on my eyelid to try to reduce the size of the tumor. I had identified a highly acclaimed ophthalmic reconstructive surgeon and had the surgery. The <clears throat> surgery caused a great deal of physical pain, and afterward there was an enormous amount of swelling. And the surgeon kept telling me the swelling will go down, the swelling will go down, the swelling will go down. And eventually the swelling did go down, but the swelling had so stretched out my eyelid that there was never any cosmetic improvement in my appearance. I, I took two years off between college and law school. Uh, and in that period, in part because of how sick and tired I was at professional and social difficulties, that stemmed in part from my appearance, I decided to have the large portion of the tumor on my cheek debulked. And I identified a surgeon at UPenn uh, and had the surgery done there. When all was said and done, the surgeon did a remarkable job and the tumor was significantly larger. But the pain, um, <clears throat> recovery was simply awful. I couldn't chew for a long time. The pain was severe. Surviving on insure and broth was not pleasant. Um, and I don't recall for how long it took me to look and feel semi-normal, but it was so awful that I told my family that if I ever raised the possibility of having further reconstructive surgery, that they should talk me out of it and tell them that I told them to stop me. Many years have passed since then, and every now and then I toy with the idea of further reconstructive surgery. But I still remember how awful the recovery was, and I choose not to do it. I have had other surgeries. My appendix was basically a tumor, so it came out. Eight years ago, I broke my leg, uh, and I dislocated my patella on my stump. I was stuck in a wheelchair for a long time since I can't walk on axillary crutches. And I was terrified that given my history of non-union that the bone would never heal. But eventually it did. So what about me now? Well, as Carol said, I am a lawyer and I represent financial institutions in a variety of issues. 
And I have the privilege of sitting on the board of directors of the Children's Tumor Foundation, where I chair its Legal Affairs and Ethics Committee. I have been around the National NF Foundation, now CTF, for as long as I can remember. I first consulted with Alan Rubenstein uh, when I was a young boy. He was a young doc specializing in NF, and he, a nurse, Lynn Cordemanche, and a lawyer, Joel Herstritt, founded the National NF Foundation. Um, and at the time, the foundation was run strictly by volunteers, and it was very small. My folks were committed to learning what they could and to helping the foundation grow. My father helped professionalize the foundation and the board of directors. And in 1981, he drafted what I think is the foundation's first business plan. I recently found a copy tucked into an old file, and it's really quite amazing. In 1983, he wrote a section of the plan called the National NF Foundation Tomorrow. It reads that the foundation will be and be recognized as being the center for information and access to resources on NF. It will be an effective, productive, publicly known voluntary organization that is well-funded and politically potent. It will have made NF a household word. His words were fairly prescient. Uh, at the time, he was working for the advertising giant Young and Rubicam, and he got its PR uh, company, Burson Marsteller, to create a logo for the foundation. Uh, and I thought it was a great piece of branding. It divided up the word neurofibromatosis into three easily pronounceable segments divided by bullet points. And that branding lasted until the foundation changed its name to CTF. My mother was all in. She even became an early president of the foundation. For a time, the foundation was in our apartment, in our den. During her tenure, the foundation awarded $40,000 in research grants. It grew and it grew and it hired its first professional staff. It continued to grow and do great things and it has become what is now the Children's Tumor Foundation. I don't want to digress too much and people who have heard me talk about my history with the foundation before have heard this before. So I won't belabor it because I am in fact a big booster of CTF. I support it, I support its mission, I support its executive leadership, but I was livid when the National NF Foundation decided to change its name. Had I been on the board, I would have opposed the name change vehemently. The Children's Tumor Foundation is not a foundation dedicated to finding, fighting all tumors in children. It is not a pediatric NF foundation. Its goal, my goal, is to end NF. Thankfully, most children with NF grow up to be adults with NF. And I thought the name change would hurt me and would hurt other adults with NF. I now continue uh, my parents' legacy, uh, and <clears throat> though I do alter it a bit. After all, my parents were fighting for their son. And I always knew that, and I always was grateful for it. But in a way, I took it for granted as well. After all, I thought, that's just what parents do. But here's what I see now as an adult. Tenacious, iron-willed parents who want to learn about NF and help their kids and fight this disease and would do anything to help their kids. I have sometimes stood back in awe at the focus, at, excuse me, at the forces of nature that parents are to help their kids with NF. Not long ago, I had an interesting discussion with a parent of a young child with NF. I was asked, Ken, when did your parents first tell you that you had NF? He and his wife were trying to figure out when to tell their child about NF and when to tell him for the first time that he had it. They were wondering because 
they wanted to keep the information from their child. I, I, I try not to judge. And I know these parents to be wonderful and loving. But their approach to me was entirely alien. I'm not a parent, and I can't really judge what anybody else does. But I told him that I have always known that I had NF. Information was always shared with me in an age-appropriate way. But I could see, of course, that I had differences. They were patent. And even if they weren't so patent, I had to go to the doctor more frequently than my friends did. I had to have tests they didn't have. Clearly, something was different to me that any child would know and recognize. And I tried to imagine what it would be like and the shock I would endure if one day my parents sat me down and explained this to me as if it were all new. Um, and, and frankly, I think that would have been far worse and, and more terrifying. I, I suggested to him that it can be normal and natural to grow up knowing that one has NF. And in my you know, sort of anecdotal and wholly inexpert opinion, it will cause less resentment to have it normal and natural than sprung on a child as something new. I will end my talk with a short plug for CTF and our upcoming gala. This year's CTF gala, like last year's, will be an incredible celebration of the advancements in NF research and the resiliency of persons with NF. This year's gala will launch CTF's newest research initiative, the Discovery Fund, an $8 million initiative over three to five years, which will support the foundation's bench to bedside research programs, investing mission critical funds into basic, translational, and clinical research programs. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program.